Hello and welcome everyone to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you as always by the GSMC Sports Network. I am your host, Chris Shepard. Thank you guys for tuning in. We should have a very exciting show ahead where for the first time I'm going to be using some graphics from GSMC for some of my segments. For the first segment of today's show, we'll be covering the fantasy college football landscape starting off with the quarterbacks. We'll be moving on to the Stars and the Oilers, their game four in the NHL tonight. And we'll also be looking at, yes, IDP League's players especially the linebackers and the D-linemen, and we'll finish off with kind of a weird segment where I'm kind of in a stasis where, you know, the Wolves won last night. I was expecting the Mavs to sweep and for me to talk about this preview, but we'll still talk about all three teams concerned in the NBA this final series. But first, before we begin, we do always ask that you like, follow, and subscribe to our show. And also, if you want to be a big part of our show as well, ooh, sorry, previewing the first segment of today's show, do leave a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. It is a huge support to the network, me, my fellow podcasters as well, so do please consider doing that. It is highly appreciated. Now... Like I said, I kind of previewed my first segment for today's show. It should be a very exciting segment because it is my first time, like I said, using graphics for a segment. We are going to be talking about a very exciting topic, fantasy college football quarterback rankings. Some very exciting quarterbacks, some that we have already discussed on this show, some who are more high profile, and some kind of in the in-between. So without further ado, let's jump right into this segment. It should be very exciting. I'm really excited to focus on lower profile quarterbacks who I think will be very interesting fantasy prospects, especially some that I've already discussed, like I said. Now, we're going to count down backwards. This is the first time I've counted down backwards on this show to build up anticipation, but I think you guys will really like this graphic that I have today. Oop. Starting off at the number 10 spot. We have Mr. Jalen Milrow, a quarterback who came in last year, in the last year of the Nick Saban era, started off kind of rocky, had a rocky start. Nick Saban didn't know whether or not he really wanted to trust him as the Alabama quarterback last season, but then the latter half of the season, he really shined. His dual threat ability showed through, but now I think I know why he has a lower ranking but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's start off with the stats last year. Kind of reflective of how up and down his season was. Only 2,834 yards last year for 23 touchdowns, 6 picks. He was 13th in QBR at 80.5. So kind of in that median where you want to be as a QB. But for a high profile program like Alabama who always wants to compete in the SEC. That is kind of low. But moving into the reasons why I think he is as low as he is, one, obviously the coaching change. Kalen DeBoer from Washington comes in to replace Nick Saban. So we'll have to see how Jalen Milrow progresses under Kalen DeBoer's leadership. Obviously a big part of Jalen Milrow staying is that he does believe in Kalen DeBoer. Obviously, a lot of people thought he might transfer out, but no, he stayed. Kalen DeBoer seems to like him a lot, seems to want to have him progress and become the next big face of Alabama football. So we'll definitely have to see how and what version of Jalen Milrow we get next season. Is it going to be the timid Jalen Milrow who didn't immediately win the starting job, or are we going to get the latter half of the season Jalen Milrow who led Alabama to the college football playoff when it looked like they were in dire straits. Also, another big reason why I think Jalen Milrow is ranked this low is because of his wide receiver group. It's not as talented as it was last year. Gone is Isaiah Bond to Texas. Gone is Jermaine Burton as well, a Georgia transfer last year who was one of his favorite targets. Also, Amari Nyblak, the tight end, gone to Texas as well. But in comes Jeremy Bernard, a Washington transfer, obviously the Kalen DeBoer influence there. Did not play as much for Washington because he was sitting behind one of the best wide receiver groups groups last year in college football, but he wants to be a star. Two other guys, kind of younger guys, Kendrick Law coming in 
Kobe Prentice, who has had limited game action during his time at Alabama. So we'll have to definitely see how Jalen Milrow progresses under Kalen DeBoer, how he integrates this newer wide receiver core. But I'm really excited to see if Jalen Milrow can continue his progress. Coming in at number nine, a quarterback who has been kind of aligned a little bit, kind of been chewed up and spit out, obviously in a pressure cooker environment, moving into an environment that I think might suit him a bit better. Yes, that is Haynes King. I remember Haynes King coming in from the class of 2020, four-star recruit to Texas A&M, wanted to be the face of the Jimbo Fisher era. Jimbo Fisher, obviously collecting a huge recruiting class for Texas A&M, but his progress never truly did translate to Texas A&M. Yes, he had that one occasional good game that every t Texas A&M quarterback for the past couple of years has had against Alabama, but he hasn't really been the guy, but he has the traits. So guess what he does? He transfers to Georgia Tech of the ACC last year, and he had pretty good stats. 2,842 yards, 27 touchdowns, 16 picks though, and only 28th in QBR at 73.2. So you can see see that he has the ability he just needs to put it together but I think moving in from a pressure cooker factory that was the Jimbo Fisher era at Texas A&M to a more comfortable setting where he's not projected to be a huge face of a program I think will work wonders for him he'll just continue to improve he does have a younger receiving core Eric Singleton last year was fourth in yards per game for the team and he was a true freshman last year that just goes to show how inexperienced this wide receiver group is he does bring back Chris Elko and Chase Lane a redshirt senior but those two guys were redshirts last year so Haynes King Obviously, he doesn't have as high profile of a wide receiver group as he wants. He's not as high profile as he used to be. But still, I think that he has merit and could be a nice little steal for a fantasy uh, college football team. Coming in at number eight, this guy has just been rave reviews all around in spring practices for Tennessee he is considered to be the hope for this program as they want to continue their rise in the SEC. Nico Yamalieva. We don't have a lot of history with this guy. We don't know his huge story. He was limited last year. Obviously, they wanted to redshirt him and continue to progress. Obviously, they had Joe Milton already, so he had to sit out last year. He had 314 yards last year. His Citrus Bowl performance kind of up and down. Didn't have as many passing yards, but he did show his dual threat ability. And even though he wasn't ranked, he had a 79.3 QBR last year. This is kind of on blind faith, I think, this ranking for Nico Yamalieva. He has a lot of promise as a five-star recruit. I think a lot of it comes down to his wide receiver group, kind of journeymen group, kind of guys that haven't really shined for Tennessee but want to. Brew McCoy has been a guy who's moved around a lot. He's had only 217 yards last year in five games. Had a really up and down college career. Squirrel White trying to be that number one receiver with 803 yards last year. Only two touchdowns, though. It's just going to show how uneven the Tennessee offense has been over the past couple of years, last year especially. Sorry. But overall, Nico Yamalieva, I think this could be a very interesting ranking. He could move higher. He could move lower. We really don't know because he hasn't had that much game time. So I think right now, this is where he should sit. Moving on to a much more experienced quarterback, a guy who seemingly has been around forever and probably like his, what, seventh year of college football, K.J. Jefferson. Last year kind of saw a little bit of that decline from Big K.J. Only 2,107 yards last year for 19 TDs and 8 interceptions, ranked 88th in QBR last year. But... I think that this ranking proves his experience. I mean, Arkansas has not been that good in the Sam Pittman era as people expect it to be, but K.J. Jefferson has been a solid, highly underrated, underutilized, in my opinion, QB. I think that Sam Pittman has at his arsenal. He doesn't necessarily have that experience of a wide receiver group either. Bryce Stevens was redshirted last year. And one of their best receivers, Andrew Armstrong, had over 1,000 yards, but that was two years ago. So K.J. Jefferson, I kind of I get it. I like K.J. Jefferson as a QB, 
But in terms of fantasy, he's not a guy who's going to stat pad, you know what I mean? You can see the obvious decline as he moves on. Obviously, he's not going to have an NFL career. I kind of feel like he's kind of one of those Michael Penix types. But K.J. Jefferson could prove to be very valuable if Arkansas's easier schedule plays out to his advantage. So I like K.J. at number seven. Moving on to number six, our first group of five representative Jordan McLeod Jordan McLeod last year had a really impressive season at James Madison obviously James Madison transferring from the FCS to the FBS and he was a huge catalyst for why they made that uh, jump so swimmingly I think that Jordan McLeod transferring to Texas State is kind of like a, a lesser Cam Ward when Cam Ward was uh, at Incarnate Word now at Miami from Washington State. So this kind of could be like a feel-good story. KJ stats last, Jordan McLeod stats last year, 3,657 yards, 35 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions, 33rd in QBR. I think that Jordan McLeod has a very exciting team. Isaac Norris, Kylan Evans, young guys, I think that he can rebuild this program, get Texas State to relevancy like he did JMU. But moving on to the number five spot, Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart might be, in my opinion, probably the second best quarterback in the SEC, in my opinion. Obviously, he loses a lot of production, lost Quinshawn Judkins to Ohio State. However, Henry Parrish transfers back from Miami to be his backfield partner. He has Trey Harris, 985 yards last year. Jordan Watkins, very experienced as well. One of the most experienced wide receiver cores in this top 10, in my opinion. He had 3,292 yards last year, 26 TDs, 11 picks. Only 73rd in QBR, but that just go to show the volume of throws that he has under Lane Kiffin. I think this is the season where Lane Kiffin can, can truly say the popcorn is ready. Jackson Dart, top five quarterback in my opinion. Number four, kind of a weird ranking here. You don't really see a lower profile Big 12 QB this high, but Garrett Green of West Virginia is at number four in these rankings. I really don't see why, but he did have a big year last year. 2,406 yards, 16 touchdowns, 4 picks, 20th in QBR. I think that Garrett Green is one of those guys who, on a lesser profile team in a conference that's just adding more teams that are much more talented than West Virginia. He's a senior, he has experience, so we'll have to see how that shakes out. But I don't see him being a high value pick. I don't really like him as high as 4. I've never really known his game as much, obviously, as a fan of the Big 12. Haven't really seen him uh, play a lot, even though as a senior, he does have experience. I think that's what merits this ranking. I just don't feel he's as good as some of the other guys. Coming in at number three of exciting quarterback we have already mentioned on the show, Byron Brown of the USF Bulls. I think that Byron Brown is one of the best group of five quarterbacks, not as good as the guy at number one, who we also mentioned on the show. He had 3,292 yards, 26 touchdowns, 11 picks. I think that Byron Brown is high risk, high reward kind of guy. He wants to be competitive. He wants to be hungry. He wants to develop this young USF team. I think his dual threat ability goes to show that he can shine in some in many areas that people value in a fantasy college football team. I think this is a very exciting ranking for him, but he's not as good as two of the two guys above him. Coming in at number two, one of the probably the best college football quarterbacks of the past five years, if not probably of all time, Dylan Gabriel. What can we say about this man that hasn't already been said before? Over 10,000 passing yards in his college career, moving from UCF to Oklahoma and now at Oregon, where he has an exciting wide receiver core that added Evan Stewart from Texas A&M, a very exciting young receiver, Tez Johnson, a number two option last year behind, obviously, Troy Franklin. But Dylan Gabriel comes in last year. His stats from Oklahoma last year, 3,660 yards, 30 touchdowns, 6 picks, 4th in QBR. Just goes to show how high of a level he plays at. Just an incredible player, in my opinion, for the Oregon Ducks. They get a gem of a quarterback transitioning from Bo Nix to Dylan Gabriel. But he's not as good, in my opinion, as the number one guy. A guy who we mentioned already on the show. Caden Salter of the Liberty Flames book. 
here's what you need to know about Caden Salter. I'll tell you his stats before I tell you this. 2,876 yards, not good in yards production, only 32 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, 6th in QBR last year. But here's the thing. Caden Salter last year ranked 3rd in total fantasy points for the entire year. The two guys above him are gone to the NFL. Those were Jaden Daniels and Bonex. That is how good of a player Caden Salter is. And listen, Liberty is trying to be the next UCF, the next Cincinnati, the next Tulane. In a 12-team field for the college football playoff, Liber Liberty wants to be the team that breaks in from the group of five as one of those conference champions. And Caden Salter is a big reason why. He doesn't have the high-profile receivers that some of these guys on this list do. He doesn't have the resources that other guys may have, facilities the other guys may have. But being behind two guys in the NFL, Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix, in terms of fantasy production, that's a guy you want to have on my team. But that will just about do it for this episode for the segment rather of this show coming up next we will be discussing oiler stars nhl action 